Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight meddling of Stingy Jack, the Irishman who famously, infamously, lent his name to that glorious glowing gourd, that hollowed, hollow Halloween ornament, the jack-o'-lantern. Or so the story goes. Here's the most common version of the 18th century Irish folktale. A grumpy bastard of a blacksmith by the name of Stingy Jack invites the devil for a drink but refuses to pay, hence the stingy descriptor. He convinces the devil to shapeshift into a coin to cover the tab, but when the devil obliges, Jack sticks the coin in his pocket. And much to the devil's dismay, there is a silver cross in that pocket, preventing him from returning to his original form. A deal is struck. Jack sets the devil free, and in return, the devil agrees A, to bar Jack from entering hell when he dies, and B, to leave Jack alone for a year. A quick aside, this seems like a bad deal, and it is a bad deal, because guess what? A year later, the devil comes back to mess with Jack only Jack is ready for him. He convinces the devil to climb a tree so he might enjoy a delicious piece of fruit. Once the devil is up in the tree, Jack carves a cross into the trunk. The devil can't come down. Another bad deal is struck, although this one does have the advantage of being slightly less bad than the previous deal. Jack frees the devil in exchange for 10 years of peace. Jack dies. Don't be sad, he was an asshole. The devil, true to his word, refuses to let Jack into hell. God, meanwhile, refuses to let Jack into heaven. So, what is Jack's fate? To wander forever in eternal darkness, of course. But because the devil is not totally heartless, wait, he tosses Jack a lump of burning coal from hell so he can have a bit of light. Jack carves out a turnip and sticks the coal inside, creating a lantern, hence Jack of the Lantern, which is later shortened to Jack-o-Lantern. The rest, as they say, is folklore. By which I mean there's a lot more to the story. For starters, there's the beginning of the story which most sources, the Irish Times notwithstanding, neglect. In it, Jack, acting out of character, helps an old man on the side of the road. Twist, the old man is an angel in disguise. The angel, who is clearly a fan of 1001 Nights, grants Jack three wishes, and this is where Jack's true colors and lack of imagination begin to shine through. Wish number one. Anyone who sits in Jack's chair will be stuck to the spot. Wish number two. Anyone who takes a bow from Jack's sycamore tree will be stuck to the spot. Wish number three. Anyone who borrows Jack's tools will be stuck to the spot. The angel reluctantly grants these wishes, but he makes a mental note that this Jack fellow, when the time comes, should not be allowed into heaven. Eventually, the devil comes to claim Jack, but as we already know, that plan does not go swimmingly. Granted, things don't turn out too swell for old Jackie boy either. To quote the Irish Times, It's fitting that a character trapped in an earthly purgatory should become the lasting symbol of Halloween, a time when people are as wont to offer a trick as a treat. The character of Jack, a figure who doesn't fit into heaven or heaven, Hell is unusually complex for a figure from a folktale." End quote. This begs the question, how are we supposed to feel about Stingy Jack? Should we be satisfied that this mean-spirited blacksmith got his comeuppance? Or like the talkative Irish uncle quoted in an 1836 issue of the Dublin Penny Journal, a man who claims to have seen Jack with his own eyes, should we pity the jack-o'-lantern's namesake? Quote, if you knew the sufferings of that forsaken crather, since the time the poor soul was doomed to wander, with a lantern in his hand, on this cold earth, without rest for his foot, or shelter for his head, until the day of judgment. Oh, it's ud softened the heart of stone to see him as I once did, the poor old Dunnan, his feet blistered and bleeding, his ponine's rags all flying about him, and the rains of heaven beating on his old white head. End quote. Bogged down by the details, the original meaning of jack-o'-lantern. So, case closed, right? We carve scary faces into vegetables on Halloween because an 18th century Irish folk anti-hero once shoved a hell coal into a turnip. Makes perfect sense. The jack-o'-lantern is a symbol of Stingy Jack's suffering. It's the perfect decoration for commemorating this awful, crafty man. Or not, because another interpretation holds that the purpose of creating jack-o'-lanterns is not to celebrate Stingy Jack, but to protect oneself from him. To quote journalist Kayla Hertz, writing for Irish Central, this legend is why people in Ireland and Scotland began to make their own versions of Jack's lantern by carving grotesque faces into turnips, mangelwurzels, potatoes, and beets, placing them beside their homes to frighten away Stingy Jack and other wandering evil spirits and travelers." End quote. If both of these explanations feel a bit tenuous, it's because they are. The truth is, the story of Stingy Jack was not invented to explain the origin of carved vegetable lanterns, which, as we'll explore later, go back thousands of years. Instead, the story was invented to explain a different phenomenon altogether. Ignis Fatuus. Also known as Will o' the Wisps, Fairy Lights, Fool's Fire, and yes, Jack o' Lanterns, Ignis Fatuus refers to the incredibly eerie but entirely natural flickering of lights that occurs over peat bogs and marshlands. It's caused by the combustion of gases that are released from decomposing organic matter. Remember that talkative Irish uncle quoted in the previous section? He told his Stingy Jack story while gazing out at a peat bog, observing the Ignis Fatuus. That's the explanation he gave for what he was seeing, and at the time, it was a common one. According to 
to Nathan Mannion, senior curator of Dublin's Irish Immigration Museum, the Ignis Fatuus once seemed like, quote, a floating flame that would move away from travelers, end quote. Mannion went on to tell National Geographic, if you were to try to follow the light, you could go into a sinkhole or bog or drown. People thought it was Jack of the Lantern, a lost soul or a ghost, end quote. To make matters even more convoluted, there is another possible origin for the term jack-o'-lantern, one that eschews ghosts and devils and flaming bog farts and replaces them with something far more mundane, night watchmen. You see, in 17th century Britain, Jack was a common catch-all for someone whose name you didn't know, sort of like the John Doe of its time. So an anonymous night watchman would sometimes be called a Jack of the Lantern, or Jack-o'-lantern. Add to this the 18th century tradition out of Worcestershire, England, known as the Hoberty's Lantern, which could be made by hollowing out a turnip, carving a face on the outside, and sticking a candle inside. And it's possible that the jack-o'-lantern is actually a British innovation. Gasp. I can hear my Irish great-grandfather rolling in his grave. Assuming he isn't roaming the eternal darkness of an earthly purgatory, one can never be sure. That being said, the Irish origin for the jack-o'-lantern is still widely held by scholars and historians, and the main reason for that has to do with the Emerald Isle's Celtic history. The Celtic Connection. Samhain and the Cult of the Head. In Celtic enclaves of Northern Europe, specifically Ireland, Scotland, Wales, the Isle of Man, Cornwall, and Brittany, the carving of human faces into round fruits and vegetables has been going on for thousands of years. It is a tradition, according to our pal Mannion of the Irish Immigration Museum, that likely evolved from the Celtic custom of head veneration, wherein the severed heads of one's enemies were taken as war trophies. One needs only to peruse the myths of ancient Ireland to see the significance that was placed on heads. Not like literally placed on top of heads, you know what I mean. For for example, there's the story of the Ulster hero Cuchulain, the Hound of Cullen, who returned from his first ever battle with three heads hanging from his chariot, as well as, quote, nine heads in one hand and ten in the other, and these he brandished at the hosts in token of his valor and prowess, end quote. Meanwhile, in the destruction of the Durgis Hostel, the warrior Connell pours water into the mouth of the High King of Ireland, Conair Moore's severed head, and the head thanks him. History confirms this Celtic obsession with the head. Ancient historians Livy and Diodorus Siculus both recount instances of Celtic warriors hanging the severed heads of their slain foes from the necks of their horses. Siculus further notes that especially distinguished foes were given the royal treatment. Their heads were embalmed in cedar oil and displayed with pride to visitors. This practice is also reflected in the ancient Irish tradition of creating brain balls, wherein the brains of enemies were hardened with lime and used as slingshot projectiles. Lovely. So why were heads so important to ancient Celtic peoples, including the Irish? To quote historian Peter Peter Beresford Ellis's A Dictionary of Irish Mythology, the ancient Irish revered the human head as indeed did all ancient Celtic societies. It was in the head and not in the heart that they seemed to locate the souls of men and women. Archaeological finds give full corroboration to this cult." End quote. During the Gaelic Celtic festival of Samhain, when it was believed that souls from the other worlds were able to cross over to the land of the living, the Celt of the Head reached a fever pitch. Armed with a plethora of root vegetables from the recent harvest, as Samhain marked the end of one pastoral year and the beginning of the next, ancient peoples carved frightening faces in an effort to ward off restless souls. There was also a fire element to the festival of Samhain. On the night of October 31st, when the festival began, all fires burning across Ireland and other Celtic countries were supposed to be extinguished and could only be rekindled thereafter from a ceremonial fire lit by druids. To facilitate this practice, a good deal of lanterns were needed to transport the coals. Hence, those carved root vegetables ended up serving a practical purpose in addition to a symbolic one. To quote Mannion, metal lanterns were quite expensive, so people would hollow out root vegetables. Over time, people started to carve faces and designs to allow light to shine through the holes without extinguishing the ember, end quote. Of course, now we're faced with a chicken and the egg problem. Did the ancient Irish turn their carved faces into lanterns, as I suggested earlier, or did they carve faces into their lanterns, as Mannion asserts? It's hard to say. But what I can tell you definitively is that when the Christians arrived on the scene, they hijacked the Festival of Samhain for their own purposes, turning November 1st into All Saints Day, aka All Hallows. Hence, the evening prior became known as All Hallows Eve, which is celebrated today as Halloween. The Celtic cult of the head was largely forgotten, and the vegetable lanterns with their frightening faces were reinterpreted by some as representations of Christian souls in purgatory. The aforementioned Stingy Jack, of course, a man forever stuck between heaven and hell, fits that Christian interpretation to a tee. So in addition to being used to explain the phenomenon of Ignis Fatuus, and later to explain the origins of the jack-o'-lantern, the story of Jack was employed, quote, as a cautionary tale, a morality tale, according to Mannion, who elaborates, Jack was a soul trapped between two worlds, and if you you behaved like he did, you could end up like that too." End quote. From Turnips to Pumpkins The Americanization of the Jack-O-Lantern 
If the history of the Jack Lantern wasn't already convoluted enough for you, we have a whole nother era to explore, arguably the Jack O' Lantern's golden age, the Age of Pumpkins. In the midst of and in the decades following the Great Famine, millions of Irish immigrants fled to North America and with them they brought their ancient Samhain slash Halloween tradition of vegetable carving. While originally accustomed to using turnips, beets, and potatoes as their canvases, these Irish immigrants easily adapted their arts to the more rotund and versatile pumpkin, a gourd native to the New World. The first mention of the pumpkin jack-o'-lantern ostensibly appears in Nathaniel Hawthorne's 1835 short story The Great Carbuncle, in which a band of adventurers seeks out a legendary gem. To quote Hawthorne, Hide it under thy cloak, sayst thou, why it will gleam through the holes and make thee look like a jack-o'-lantern. End quote. Given that The Great Carbuncle was written before the massive influx of Irish immigrants to North America, however, it is possible that Hawthorne is not actually referencing a pumpkin jack-o'-lantern in this passage, but the phenomenon of ignis fatuus. Remember, that was the original meaning of the word. That's not to say, however, that an earlier group of Irish immigrants couldn't have introduced the carved vegetable lantern meaning of jack-o'-lantern to Hawthorne. The matter is up for debate. According to the Irish Times, the first definitive reference to a pumpkin jack-o'-lantern carved in celebration of Halloween occurred in 1886, when a Canadian news paper, The Daily News, reported the following, quote, The old-time custom of keeping up Halloween was not forgotten last night by the youngsters of the city. There was a great sacrifice of pumpkins from which to make transparent heads and faces lighted up by the unfailing two inches of tallow candle. End quote. However, it should be noted that the first image of a pumpkin jack-o'-lantern appeared nearly two decades before this in the November 23rd, 1867 issue of Harper's Weekly. It was published alongside an article titled A Pumpkin Effigy, but, and this is an important but, the article did not refer to the carved gourd as a jack-o'-lantern, nor did it reference Halloween. By the turn of the century, the pumpkin jack-o'-lantern had become the symbol of Halloween in North America. While once intended to scare off unwanted nocturnal visitors, these incandescent decorations are now most frequently used, despite their often grotesque appearance to welcome visitors and convey a sense of joviality and community. To quote Cindy Ott, author of Pumpkin, the Curious History of an American Icon, at Halloween you don't go up to someone's house unless they have a jack-o'-lantern. It's about cementing a community, projecting good values, neighborliness. The pumpkin and jack-o'-lantern take on those meanings too. If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment and tap all of the little buttons by the end of it. Make sure you are subscribed to the Irish Myths channel. That really, really helps. And if you want to learn the rest of the Samhain story, check out my book Samhain In Your Pocket, a tiny little book about the Celtic origins of Halloween. A text version of this Jack Lantern essay is included in there, and there are also chapters on the history of Samhain, the mythology behind Samhain, and the three Irish gods of death, the Morgon, Dawn, and Billa. Fun! My name is I.E. Neverday, editor of the short story collection Neon Druid and creator of IrishMyths.com. Thanks for coming out.